Hello, I'm Dr. Linda Bradley, founder and chairwoman of Cleveland Clinic Celebrate Sisterhood. Welcome to our 2021 virtual education series, Celebrate Sisterhood 3.0. During this series, our experts will share information to keep you and your family healthy. This program is designed especially for you. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Hello everyone and welcome to the first virtual Celebrate Sisterhood event of 2021. This is a community outreach and education program that empowers multicultural women to embrace self-care and strive for optimal health for themselves, their families, and their communities. This event is pre-recorded. If you have any questions about the information shared today, please email CelebrateSisterhood at ccf.org. My guests today are Dr. Kendall Cobb, our new Associate Chief of Staff, Family Medicine Physician, and Clinical Associate Professor of Family Medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University. And Dr. Thomas Frazier, Vice Chairman of the Department of Infectious Disease and Medical Director for Hospital Epidemiology and Antimicrobial Stewardship at Cleveland Clinic. Today's topic is Trust, Truth, and Transparency, a conversation about the COVID-19 vaccine. This topic is very timely. Scientists have been working literally around the clock to develop safe vaccines, and their hard work has paid off. We know that vaccination is the most important public health measure we have to slow the spread of the COVID-19 virus. Having a significant portion of the public vaccinated and developing herd immunity will help us prevent serious hospitalizations and death and will eventually allow a return to normal. Our guest today will discuss COVID-19 vaccine development testing, side effects, and efficacy to help you make informed decisions regarding vaccination. You will also hear advice on keeping healthy during the pandemic. Welcome, and thanks for joining us. As of March 2021, it's been one year since we learned about the novel COVID-19 virus. None of us would ever guess the pervasive consequences that this virus would evoke on every aspect of our lives. But we now have real hope due to the emergence of vaccination. We're excited about the availability of vaccines as we now believe that it will help us get back to normal. Dr. Frazier, I'm gonna ask you to help us first understand how the studies were perform performed who was included in the trials and what does the data tell us? So uh, this has really a, a been a great, uh, a great accomplishment, as you mentioned. Um, multiple companies were supported by the federal government uh, in many cases to bring vaccine research to, to trial. Um, one company, Pfizer, invested its own money but then through uh, development of these platforms, they use platforms that had been existing before, um, platform meaning a way in which to develop a vaccine. Um, and then they um, did preliminary studies on volunteers to show that the vaccine was safe and that it would do what it uh, was intended to do. So the first two uh, vaccines that sort of led the pack uh, are the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, these are a brand new uh, sort of technology. They built on uh, the use of mRNA. That's what's in the vaccine. Is a small little message which shows to our immune system uh, or it allows our immune system to, to see 
a protein from the virus and then be ready if it's exposed to it in the future. Since those two came out, then also there's a more recent one, Johnson & Johnson, similar process, trial and volunteers to, to show safety and the fact and efficacy as they would say. And then all these three vaccines, including other vaccines that have been developed around the world, are then studied in a large population, a larger population. And so for the, the Pfizer and the Moderna trial, there were over 30,000 people. Um, similarly for the Johnson & Johnson, tens of thousands of people. I don't know the exact number in the Johnson & Johnson trial. And they both demonstrated that they prevented people from getting uh, symptomatic COVID-19 disease. That is, if you had the vaccine, you didn't develop symptoms consistent with the virus, um, you didn't get admitted to the hospital as frequently, and you didn't die. And so that's what uh, happened. Now, the, in the trials, the FDA asked that you, you know, it's not as though they only did it in 18 year old people in boot camp. They tried to make the trials be representative of the community at large. And so the age range was from young adult to up over 65 uh, into 70 um, and different, uh, so different ethnic backgrounds as well. Uh, to try to do as best they could to reflect the population that would be receiving the vaccine. So I want to make sure I got this right. I'm going to try to make sure I understand how that mRNA vaccine works. I sometimes tell my patients that once you get the shot in the arm, this, this vaccine goes into your system and is able to recognize invaders. It's kind of like it has a wanted poster sign flagging in your body and every time it sees potential spike protein, it's gonna attack it. Does it work something like that? So it kind of gives you like a wanted poster sign and knows what to attack, what not to attack and it's not giving you the virus, is that correct? Yes, you need to uh, sort of prime your immune system so that it has memory of seeing this protein, a protein that is not part of, of our own bodies and that is not self. And so all vaccines do this in one way, shape or form or another. And so for the mRNA vaccines, they send a little message in for the cells, the cells which make proteins, um, to present that protein on the surface of the cell. And then the immune system can say, I see this. It's not ourselves, it's not self, it's other. So that's um, then the next time the immune system sees this, it's ready to, to respond. That's great. And I also love it that you mentioned that it was pretty diverse. Certainly as African Americans, we know that they're 13% of the population and between eight and 10%, at least in the Moderna trial, were um, African Americans and I think about 15 to 20% Latina X from what I've read. So I think that what you just mentioned is really good and for our patients to know that there was broad representation and we're very pleased with those volunteers that participated in this trial and continue to be followed. How Dr. Frazier does the J&J &J vaccine work? I know it's a little different. Can you give us an update on that? So as I mentioned, every vaccine has to find a way to deliver the message. To, to deliver uh, something so the immune system can see it. Johnson & Johnson uses a virus, uh, an adenovirus, that is not a pathogen. It's not a virus that would make you sick. But within that virus vector or that, that virus messenger, uh, it has, similar to the mRNA, the message that cells take up and present to the immune system to say, here it is, this is what you need to be ready for. Um, and so the platform for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is the same platform that was used to develop the Ebola vaccine. Now, that's not, so it, it, just to say there is, 
the, the, the industry worked hard to build on these platforms that had been known about, but not necessarily used in widespread fashion. And so that's why they could, they could sort of um, move quickly. And uh, I guess at warp speed, they would say, right? Um, and so that's, that's how that, vi that uh, vaccine is a little different. Can you speak, um, Dr. Frazier, on the efficacy of the first two vaccines that came out and also Johnson's and Johnson's and um, give us a, an update of that? And does it matter what that efficacy is? Well, it, it matters that it works and they, bo they both work. Um, it's difficult to compare Johnson and Johnson to the mRNA vaccines because they, the trials were a little bit different, little different um, in where they, um, and where they occurred in many aspects. But the, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine are very similar in their efficacy. And I think, you know, we've all seen the news in the, the, the studies that uh, led to them being uh, released by the FDA, they demonstrated about 94, 95% efficacy. Um, Johnson & Johnson, a little bit of a different number, overall efficacy in the 70% range. Important with the Johnson & Johnson though, particularly the outcomes that really matter, hospitalization and death, very effective, very effective. The, the Johnson & Johnson trial done in many parts of the world, numbers not quite as good in South Africa, but still robust, better than any flu shot that we've ever had in 60% range, in the United States up into the 80% range. So they're, they're all three uh, with very good results. There's been a follow-up report released on the Pfizer vaccine and the experience in Israel, where they looked at a broad swath of the population. They compared a half a million people who got vaccinated and a half a million people who did not. And again, showing very robust results when you look at a population sort of in real world, uh, you switch from efficacy to effectiveness. And um, I'm, I'm sure we'll see the same thing as uh, people report on their experience with Moderna. But um, again, quite good results for Pfizer. And uh, we expect good results with, um, with others as well. Excellent, so it sounds like the take home message for our patients with these vaccines is that you're less likely to be hospitalized, you're less likely to have a severe sequela, meaning in the ICU, maybe with a ventilator, and less likely to die. It does not mean you can have no chance of getting it, but if you get it, is it true that your cases may be a little bit milder? That's what we expect, that's what we expect. And you know, we've had experience here, when you vaccinate in the middle of a pandemic, someone can get their shot, but still be exposed to the virus before they have full protective effect. And it seems like um, that the people, at least I know, who got infected in this window in between their two shots had a relatively mild illness, a relatively mild illness. But I think, you know, to your, uh, the bigger question is, you know, what's the best vaccine? The best vaccine is the one that's there for you that day. Um, I, I, you know, whatever one, if I'm in line and all three of the, you know, someone pulls this out, says, well, it's the J&J, &J, that's fine. It's the Moderna, fine. Pfizer, fine. There are some uh, benefits to the Johnson & Johnson in that it's one, one and done. Um, and that, that can be helpful. It can be a little tricky to, to adjust lives to make, make time for two shots. Um, so there's just uh, some different advantages to each one, but they're, they're all three are effective. Right, and I've, I've heard also with Johnson & Johnson, a regular doctor's office or a clinic may have it. You don't have to have that deep freeze like you're in Antarctica in terms of refrigeration. Is that correct also? That is correct. That is good, but it's a little easier on the handling. Let me ask you, um, in fact, I'll ask both of you, um, Dr. Cobb and Dr. Frazier. Many patients have said to me, you know, I don't know about this shot because it's gonna change my DNA. 
I'll let each of you give me a chance to, give each of you rather a chance to answer that. Does it change your DNA? No, it, it doesn't change your DNA. It doesn't have anything to do with your DNA. It basically helps your body to recognize something that is other than what's supposed to be there. You know, one other thing we often hear is that, you know, I'm worried about um, the mRNA vaccine because it was rushed, this issue of Operation Warp Speed. Was the mRNA vaccine development rushed? So the way that I think of it is that, as Dr. Frazier was mentioning, they built upon previous work. And so mRNA vaccine, they had started to develop these over the last 20 plus years. And then because there was a lot, everybody was concentrating on let's take care of this, then a lot of energy went into the process. A lot of the bureaucracy and red tape that people often have to deal with was removed. And so in that way, people were really able to focus on going through the process and it still went through all of the trials to make sure it was safe and effective before releasing it to the general public. I think the thing that allowed it to move at, at great speed as far as having vaccine available is not only did um, the companies invest, you know, for Pfizer, they invested themselves or the, you know, the Operation Warp Speed. They said, here, we're going to give you the money as necessary to develop the vaccine. And at the same time, we're going to give you the money to produce it. So in traditional development um, and drug discovery, you know, you invest the money and, and then do your study. And if it works, then you start making it. And in this case, the, you know, the, the risk was assumed, um, you know, and there are vaccines that have not made it as far as these three. Um, and so again, it's just, they made it at the same time they proved it would work. Thank you. And I really thank you, Dr. Cobb, for just mentioning this long history of mRNA um, technology. I've been recently reading that right now there are five programs and clinical trials using mRNA vaccination. Uh, two are for vaccination and three are therapeutic. So for instance, I think our, our viewers would love knowing where else might this technology take us. Well, they're doing studies right now for skin cancer, head and neck squamous cancers, and even a phase two trial using mRNA vaccine for ovarian cancer. So um, do you know of any other um, trials, Dr. Frazier, that are in the works or in the pipeline using mRNA technology? You know, you know I, I must admit I don't. Um, I'm sure that, um, the door is going to open wide to this, but as you mentioned, these initially were developed to be tumor vaccines yeah. for, for uh, cancer care. Um, and that was a little bumpy at first, but um, the opportunity to use it for uh, infectious diseases presented itself. I think it's exciting. And again, I think it gives us more um, comfort in being able to tell patients that this is not rushed. Lots and lots of um, potential new applications. I've even read about dementia and Alzheimer's studies that might be down the pike using this technology. So just stay tuned, I guess is what I would say. So I ask you now, Dr. Cobb, there are lots of myths in the public domain about vaccines, social media, Twitter. What are your patients saying to you? And how do you debunk some of these myths? Yeah, so people um, hear all sorts of things. Uh, fertility, the one that you mentioned earlier, that it affects their, their body as far as their DNA somehow. Um, people want to know that it is safe and that it's not going to adversely affect them. And so something that commonly comes up when people are in the office with me, they'll say, well, are you going to get it? And I said, I did get it. And so that helps people to feel somewhat better that they know someone and trust someone that has received the vaccine and that I'm still, you know, conducting my normal life. I haven't had any um, long-term effects from it. So really, I would encourage people to look at the CDC website, look at the Ohio Department of Health website, 
to find out what they can expect and what's in it as opposed to um, listening to some of the, the things that people might be saying on social media. Are there any special tips of the trade, so to speak, for our elders and those from underserved communities about vaccine hesitancy that you might add? And more importantly, also, what is the Cleveland Clinic and our community doing to address these concerns? So there have been a lot of outreach uh, programs. Uh, Dr. Harris uh, spoke at the City Club uh, about the vaccine, but also we've been having different forums, including one that you and your husband are um, talking about. I've heard people say it's not vaccine hesitancy as much as vaccine deliberation. If you think about um, the history of this country, I can understand why people want to make sure that this is something that they should do and that it's safe. And so really deliberating on the pros versus the, the risk. I have uh, friends who one lost both her parents, another one lost his father. And so knowing sort of the bad outcomes that can happen, um, I'm acutely aware of um, the bad parts of COVID. And so I think that weighing sort of the couple of days of maybe not feeling so great after the second dose um, is comparatively uh, little to go by. Now, I would say that if possible, I encourage people to have it, the vaccine done on like a Saturday morning so that they have the rest of the weekend to recover. Um, but more than willing to write a note for somebody um, if they aren't feeling well the day after they've gotten it. You know, one other thing, we're both seeing patients. What I also share with my patients when as uh, African-American communities think about the Tuskegee um, syphilis trial that went on for almost three decades, that that trial um, withheld treatment. The COVID vaccination is giving hope to decrease the chance of getting um, um, an illness. So I think it's very, very different. I think what we call our institutional review boards closely monitor what's, do, what's done, our research nurses. So I think it's held under the highest scientific conduct for, for trials. And again, reassuring our patients um, is important. I too just got my vaccine last month and my mother who's 90, I just took her last week. So again, I think it's good that we can give our own stories and our family stories um, and go from there. Are there any special programs that the Cleveland Clinic is partnering with in our community for vaccine um, administration? Uh, so at Langston Hughes and Fairfax, um, we're administering the vaccine there, uh, as well as people in the public can sign up to get the vaccine um, at any of our various sites. And so um, really wanting to make sure that the vaccine is available to anybody who wants it. And one of the, the challenges in the first couple of months was that we weren't getting that much as far as a vaccine at a time. And that amount has increased. So um, we're able to vaccinate more people. And then um, by the time this airs, um, we'll have already started, but um, FEMA is administering the vaccine at the Wolstein Center, um, and that will be uh, seven days a week um, uh, for 12 hours a day, and they anticipate giving about 6,000 shots a day. So um, definitely can get it many places. And the city will be giving coupons for bus vouchers and possible lift tickets. So I think this is also helps with our underserved community to uh, access the vaccine. Let me ask, thank you so much. Let me ask Dr. Frazier, both of you in fact, um, what do you tell your patients who are thinking about getting pregnant, are pregnant and even breastfeeding? Um, the severity of illness for pregnant people that get the actual disease of COVID tend to be worse than um, other people that aren't pregnant. And so it's an individual decision, um, but I know that my colleague, Dr. Goji, um, is encouraging people that, that to go ahead and, and get the vaccine if that's something that they're interested in. Um, and the, your uh, national organization, ACOG has said that we shouldn't withhold the vaccine um, from pregnant people.
correct. Are there any patients, Dr. Frazier, that you can think of as a, just an overall category that should not receive the vaccine? Um, no, I think, uh, you know, the only person we don't want showing up in the line who's somebody who is ill with COVID. Uh, so I, I, I can't really, I can't really think of one. I think what's important to remember is that, um, you know, there are people who may not have a good immune system and, um, you know, maybe going through treatment for cancer, for example. Um, and it's perfectly fine for them to get the vaccine, but it's probably just as important that everybody in the household gets the vaccine. So, you know, we talk about having a circle of trust. Um, this disease has been driven by close contact in households. And so it's really important when the opportunity is there and Dr. Cobb brought up the Wolstein Center, you know, we're the vaccine for the Wolstein Center is in our freezers right now. We're supporting that, that effort. Um, get on, spend the time online when you have the opportunity, get an appointment, get the shot. Um, it's the best way to protect your loved ones, uh, the, the people in your, in your immediate life that are perhaps a little vulnerable or just that you don't want to bring it home to them. Um, and I think that's, that's very important. So I'm going to just reiterate this because the patients that I see three days a week, um, they ask, and I'm sure Dr. Cobb also, I have hypertension, diabetes, sickle cell, lupus, I'm on dialysis. I mean, it's almost as if they're asking for a disease that they might have to keep them from getting the vaccine. So I love what you're saying um, that pretty much get it, always talk with your physician. But I too, if I had a multiple choice exam question, I, or fill in the blank would probably be better. I wouldn't know what answer to put there that's right off the top of my head. So like we are saying, it's important to get the shot in the arm. Almost everything that you could have um, will be um, okay to proceed and you can always speak with your physicians. Let me ask each of you, what are the top three to five concerns that you've heard from your patients about taking the vaccine and how do you inform them about the safety? We're all drinking the Kool-Aid, we understand this, but what are your patients coming up to tell you um, in your office? I'll let you each take a, a stab at it, so to speak. <laughs> People wanna make sure that the vaccine's not going to give them COVID. And as we've talked about, the vaccine does not contain any of the virus at all. And so um, that's one thing. People are sometimes concerned about, well, am I not gonna feel well? Um, and, you know, it, the vast majority of people that, that I have seen have not had a reaction or had like immune response, I should say to the first dose unless they had had COVID in the past. And then they tend to be sort of more achy after that first dose. Um, after the second dose, some people feel fine. Um, I felt somewhat tired and a little bit achy for about a day. Um, and people have different things. So people sort of want to know like what's common. And so again, there's a list of like different things that people can anticipate. And then people want to know like, can I take anything before I get the vaccine? And um, I tell them that they shouldn't take like any medicines to like try to prevent any of those side effects before they get the vaccine. Um, I took some Tylenol after I got the vaccine, acetaminophen. Um, so those are the, the main ones that come up. And how about you, Dr. Frazier? I think I agree with the, the comments that Dr. Cobb has. And I, I you know, the newness, I'm not somebody who got a vaccine before. Um, I, you know, if the, again, the one that I hear a lot is um, I'm healthy. If I get COVID big deal. And again, this, this virus calls, uh, calls us to think beyond the tip of our own nose. It's not about you. It's the next person and then the next person. And uh, that that's, I, th I think, again, we just have to think a little bit beyond, you know, I'm, I'm 20 and I'm fine. You know, I've, you know I'll, I'll power right through this. You probably will. 
but what about the next guy? Um, and that that's challenging. We don't always do that as Americans. We don't always think that way. Right. So, so it seems like some of the common side effects that both of you have mentioned may be achiness, low-grade temperature, soreness. I've even heard patients complaining of sometimes their lymph nodes may feel a little bit swollen, uh, upper neck, underneath their arms. Do, have you found um, anything about age? Do older patients, like my mom, have fewer side effects than someone that might be in their mid-30s to 50 in terms of getting their second dose or even their first dose? Any anecdotal or scientific uh, outcome data that you could share? In the trials, uh, particularly for the mRNA vaccines, the older you are, the less likely you were to have those type of side effects. Okay. And how about you, Dr. Uh, Cobb? Have you seen that in your practice also? Yes, and yet one of my colleagues was saying, oh, I must be old because I didn't have much of a reaction, and I, I reminded her that I'm older than she is and that I had <laughs> in general, but everybody's different. Great, great. Uh, and Dr. Frazier, I do want to ask you, um, you had talked with me offline and sent a, a slide about reactogenicity from the vaccine. What is that exactly, and can you make it a little bit more easy for us to understand. So what does reactogenicity mean? So when you evaluate a vaccine, that's one of the, the, as they do the safety things, part of it is how well do you tolerate the vaccine? How, you know, so reactogenicity is the reaction to the, to the inoculation, the reaction to the shot. And so, for example, in the development of the Pfizer vaccine, they had two candidates, same technology. One made people feel lousier than the other. So the one, they both did a good job of poking the immune system and, and showing that you'd be able to respond to the virus, but they picked the one that was easier to take. And so, the reactogenicity is the sore arm and the feeling of little ache, you know, maybe a little uh, wake up in a little bit of a sweat at night, just these things that um, have that, you know, kind of poke the virus or the, the vi um, I'm sorry, poke your immune system to say, okay, this is, this is what you want to look for the next time around. And so with the vaccines, the first dose is prime, the two dose for the two dose vaccines, the first dose is prime and the second dose is boost. Um, the J and J, they don't, they get a good response without the two, the prime and the boost. Um, so that's, does that make more sense? Yeah, it makes, yeah, very, very good. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna ask also for Dr. Cobb, a pretty practical question that a lot of my patients are now hearing about. You know, we recommend over the age of 40 for every woman to have a mammogram. Um, they can, at the Cleveland Clinic, many places, they can do a walk-in. Um, so how do we advise scheduling mammograms related to receiving the vaccination? Any tips of the trade? So um, typically we'll wanna get you in for your mammogram ahead of um, the vaccine if possible. Um, if not, then that's okay. Um, what we don't want is a lot of people understandably have been putting off uh, their health maintenance because life has been very different this year. And so um, really important to go ahead and get colonoscopies, mammography. Um, if you have a, an option, we'd like to do the mammogram before you um, get the vaccine simply because of some of the things that you were talking about as far as like sometimes people have enlarged lymph nodes and that kind of thing. We don't want people to have um, increased anxiety um, that they might be having an issue with their breast when it might be um, their immune response to the vaccine. And I don't know if you or Dr. Frazier would just say if I had my mammogram scheduled um, next week, but I get my vaccine today. Should I reschedule if, if I don't have a breast mass, if everything is, quote, fine? And if so, how long should I wait to reschedule if I didn't want to get alarmed about maybe some lymph nodes showing up? Any, any thoughts? I don't know the answer to that. I would I, probably advise the person to go ahead and, and get it, but probably two weeks after they've had the vaccine would be okay. But Dr. Frazier and Dr. Bradley, I don't know if you have facts behind 
I don't have any facts, you know, new, te new territory. I wouldn't cancel your vaccine appointment and I'd get your mammogram and we can always work through the, the, any hiccups along the way. Okay, excellent. I'm gonna pivot for just a moment um, and make sure that our patients and viewers know that hospitals are safe to come for their pap smears, their mammograms, their colonoscopy, um, and that we're taking all kinds of precautions from strict hand washing to mask and face mask and shields. But tell us, um, we're moving in from 5% of patients about two years ago having telehealth visits. I think we're up to 50 to 70%. So tell us what a telehealth visit is, Dr. Cobb, and who might benefit from using those visits in terms of types of visits, if there's a little bit of concern about coming to see your doctor. Right, so um, typically if you have upper respiratory symptoms, then we'll recommend a virtual visit. So um, the technology now, um, we've learned a lot over the last several months. And so um, we are able to see you and hear you and you're able to see and hear us. Um, so cold symptoms, sinus symptoms, um, anything where it might be infectious, um, we, we try to keep those people um, out of the healthcare system um, for their own safety, um, as well as um, those other people that are coming in. And so, but really um, people can be seen for any number of uh, conditions. I think that um, virtual visits are helpful for people that might have limited time because you can continue to go about your day-to-day -day activity until just that amount of time of the visit. Um, but people with mobility issues um, sometimes choose to, to have a virtual visit. Um, people that have very busy lifestyles also. So really open to anybody. Um, and uh, we're making efforts to make sure that there, we're not adding to health disparities because not everybody has um, the same access to technology. And so taking steps to make sure that broadband um, is more easily accessible. Right, and I still say for my patients, because I have 11 telehealth visits this afternoon after we finish this, we still believe in the old fashioned telephone. So we would rather a patient, if you don't have Wi-Fi or a good broadband, you can still talk with your healthcare professional, physician um, by phone. Um, we try to do it more personally with seeing you, but if you can't, I just want to make sure that our patients know that that is still an avenue. And of course, the country is looking at making it possible for all in the future, which is excellent. I'd also ask to make sure that you still see your dentist, which you agree during this, this um, pandemic, so that's important. Let me ask each of you now, um, we each give lots of information for our patients. What are some trustworthy resources to gather information? Because we'll upload this to our website. Um, if there are any places that you like, we'll make sure that on our website that our patients can have access and be driven there. Uh, Dr. Frazier, any that you particularly like? I, th I think the CDC website is very good. Um, it, it has information on every aspect of this. Um, and it, it's going to be conservative advice. Um, it may not be advice that we want to hear, or, um, but uh, it's solid. And uh, it'll think about you and think about how you interact in your community. And so I, I think it's, it's a, uh, that would, that's my one-stop shopping for things. Okay, and that's cdc.gov. We'll put that up for our viewers. Any other for, others rather for you, Dr. Uh, Cobb? That's the one that I most consistently use is the CDC website. Okay, doke. And I also sometimes throw in the fda.gov and also our own clevelandclinic.org forward slash COVID vaccine uh, website too. So those are some places and we'll list it for all. Now I'm gonna to move to Dr. Frazier for a moment. We're talked about vaccinations. We have been, it's been well studied, but now we're getting into the variants, um, the mutations. Uh, tell me a little bit about what we need to know about COVID-19 variants and why and how do viruses mutate? What's the issues right now? So I think, um you know, a virus lives to uh, replicate, to 
to keep making more copies of itself. And um, as it does that, it keeps reproducing its genetic code over and over and over again. And when you do it that fast, there can be errors, mistakes, or just variations in how that, it, that happens. Some of those variations don't give the virus any advantage at all to keep going. And so they're sort of dead ends. However, if a certain family or a certain kind of offshoot of the virus finds that one of these changes makes it easier for it to keep spreading and keep going, then that's sort of where you get to these variants. And then you have to see, well, is this strain of the virus, is it, um, is it more contagious? Does it make people sicker? You know, what, and, and that's taking what you can learn by looking at the virus, kind of looking at its, its bl blueprint. And so then you, you hear about uh, the UK strain. That was probably the first one that in recent time has gotten a lot of press. But even going back to last summer, there was the G strain in the, in the American Southwest. And so then we've got the UK strain, and then they talk about the strain from South Africa, and then they talk about the strain from Brazil. And they all have little uh, letter number conversations, you know, B117 or a P strain virus from Brazil or B135 from South Africa. It's just all ways of, of kind of keeping track of which is which. The concern with some of these is that, again, a virus wants to live. It wants to grow and make more. And so if one like the UK strain, for example, it seems to be really good at being transmitted person to person and keeping that cycle going. Um, and so that's where you get these variants of concern. Um, and now that we have vaccine, the big question is, do any of these variants, do they slide by the vaccine? Sort of like a strain we get every, you know, there can be a different strain of influenza on a yearly basis. And so far, um, it looks like the vaccines hold up pretty darn well. Um, you know, maybe the one from South Africa, they don't hold up quite as well. But again, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine was studied in South Africa. And in the vaccine recipients, there were no hospitalizations or deaths. So um, this is just going to be a, an evolving subject. Um, and over the, the next weeks to months, you'll hear about all kinds of different variants. Like, uh, there's a California strain. There's a New York strain. Um, and these will move around the country and around the world. You know, the, the, um, over the weekend, I was reading about how someone who had gone to, the, to Britain um, to visit family, came home to Texas. There's the first evidence of the UK strain in Texas, and it's a plane flight. Um, and so uh, we're going to learn more, but right now it doesn't look like um, it doesn't look like it is something that the vaccines can't handle or prepare us for. And so just because they're variants of concern, I wouldn't give up and say, well, there's no sense in getting vaccinated because this virus is just changing. Now, if, if one variant uh, kind of takes off, then already the companies are changing the master mix. And who knows, maybe this is gonna be something where every year or two, you need a boost. They need to adjust the cocktail a little bit um, to um, account for a change in the virus. And as a medical community, we're just going to have to follow that and pay attention to that. So like right now, if a patient was seen in the ER or gets admitted to the hospital, are we clinically testing for these variants? How do we know in our own midst here at the Cleveland Clinic or even in the city of Cleveland, what variants are in our midst? In everyday clinical practice, that information is not meaningful. You know, if you come into the hospital with COVID-19, I don't do anything different based on if it's variant A or variant B. Um, 
these are things that you'll have to look at and are being looked at as a population as a whole. Um, in some research centers, they're doing this. Um, we're trying to take a look behind the scenes uh, in Cleveland, um, but it's not anything that would change what you would do right now. And variant or not, um, no variant will, will uh, be immune to wearing a mask and others wearing a mask. So the, you know, the concepts are the same, clean hands, as you mentioned, face covering, mask, um, distance. You know, it's not time yet to go hang out at the Last Chance Saloon. You know, it's, it's time to, to keep following along with this guidance and advice because it works. So can you still infect others, Dr. Frazier, Dr. Cobb, if you're fully vaccinated? I mean, do we need to double mask? What do you say to your patients for this? So I've been, I've been vaccinated, you guys have been vaccinated. Can we still infect others? Do we need to wear double mask? There's currently research going on. Um, as we talked about, the thought is that the vaccine keeps an individual from getting a bad disease, but not necessarily that they don't get it. And so one of the issues is not wanting to, being asymptomatic and passing it on to somebody else. And so I continue to wear a mask. I continue to encourage other people to wear a mask, wash their hands distance, um, because we don't know um, the research is ongoing. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, the trials, the studies weren't set up to swab every vaccine recipient every day to see if they have virus in their nose or not. And so um, it looks like it decreases the chances of you being asymptomatically infected and transmit virus. But as Dr. Cobb mentioned, we don't have that evidence right now. And so um, this isn't over yet. We still have to do these things. And if everybody does these things and gets shots, then we drive things down. And then we talk about, um, you know, not having a mask. But I think uh, for the time being, it's a pain, but it, it helps. And then, you know, how many masks? Well, if you have a mask that fits, that's multiple layers, then that's a perfectly fine mask. If you have a hard time getting a fit with one mask, some people find that with two, they get a better fit. Um, but, you know, that, that's sort of, I, I would just be somewhat practical about this. You know, if I have a mask that I can put over my nose and I can pinch here and it kind of covers up like this, I don't need to add a second. If I wear a mask and I, I'm down like this, well, then I should pull up that mask and I should maybe put another one on to help me. Yeah, that's a great demonstration. So if someone's getting their second vaccine today or their first, if that's all they need to do for J at the J&J, when can we say that they're fully vaccinated? Is it a day? Is it a week? Is it a month? How long do we tell patients you've got your second shot in the arm or your first, if that's what you've got? When are you vaccinated? Two weeks. weeks. Okay. Alrighty, and what would you say then at that point? Can I hang out with you, Dr. Cobb and Dr. Frazier? You're both vaccinated. My husband and I are vaccinated. What advice do you have for the individuals that are fully vaccinated? I love cooking. So can I have you over for a cookout the first warm Saturday next month? I'm still very um, wary of, of being around other people. And so, um, I think that for for me and my family, then we're still sticking with like our little group um, and wearing masks when we're around other people. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, I'm considering going to visit family. And so even though I've been vaccinated and they've been vaccinated, we don't live in the same household. When we're not eating, we'll have on masks just to, because I'm I'm that way. But Dr. Frazier, I'm interested in your thoughts. So um, the way I would look at this is, you know, layers of protection. Hands, distance, mask, and now vaccine, a great layer. 
And so there's been a little bit of guidance come out uh, in the last week from CDC. Okay, now we're vaccinated. Okay, what can what to, what can I do? And they have this little diagram. So, you know, if um, if I'm vaccinated, I could go visit with a small group of people indoors if it's sort of one household, and I could sit down and have dinner without a mask. Okay. Now, again, to Dr. Cop's point. I'm, hey, I'm bulletproof, right? I got a, I've responded great to this vaccine. Um, and you know, I probably did. But when you start um, making it a little more complicated that it's not just, you know, me taking you up on your invitation for dinner, but it's also Joey down the street and Janie next door and you have multiple different moving parts, we're not ready yet for that. Um, and so I think that's what's important. And remember that for those of us with kids in the house, um, the kids aren't eligible for vaccines quite yet. Um, and so you have to take into that consideration. So, you know, my mother's had her shot. We have my mother over for Sunday dinner, but you know, my kids are in high school and middle school, they're wearing a mask around grandma. Gotcha. I, I have faith in, the vaccine that my mother got, but you know, us Irish kids, we got in our mothers, we, I want multiple layers um, just to assuage my concerns. Excellent. So let me ask you as we're winding down here, a few final thoughts, lingering questions, and I'll give you maybe 30 seconds each. Where do you think we'll be in four to six months? Dr. Cobb. Um, I don't think that we're going to be doing any large gatherings indoors. Like, I think that that's not likely to be the case in four to six months. I think that people will be able to um, spend time with people that they love more outdoors um, and fewer restrictions. Um, that's going to depend on all of us doing what we need to do now, which is to, to mask and get people vaccinated so that the variants don't have time to replicate and infect us. Dr. Frazier, thank you. Um, you know, I agree. I think, uh, I think when we get into July and August, we're fortunate that the weather should be good. We can be outdoors. Um, the great outdoors is an enormous uh, benefit. And then as we get into, you know, towards next school year and next fall, we have to see how next fall and the summer it's all kind of in our control as to what we do now if we get vaccinated we keep wearing the mask keeping distant that drives the vac the the virus down in the community and then as we get into the fall when we've been in traditional respiratory season we'll have to see we'll have to see do uh, some of our old friends the old viruses that you know whipped around every school year after about four to six weeks when people are con are, uh, are back in session, do they rise up? There has been no influenza, none. I've never had a, a season like this in my career. Sometime influenza is gonna come back. So we'll figure this all out, but I think we're gonna be in a much better spot July, August, September than we were last July, August and September. Okay, my last two sound bites are, what are the most important lessons learned over the last year? And finally, what things can you tell your patients about vaccination? I'll give you each 30 seconds. Lessons learned and what do you tell your patients? One sound bite or two. I would say that um, there are ways to stay active uh, even when you can't go to places that you're normally used to to doing that, that it's much more important to, to find ways to disconnect from work when you're not at work. And as far as the vaccine, I encourage people to get it. It's safe. It's going to help us to move into another stage. Um, but in the meantime, um, and even after continue to mask and, and physically distance. Same questions for you, Dr. Frazier lessons learned and your final sound bites for your patients about vaccination. Um, this has been the, mo um, the most humbling year of my career. And um, I think the lessons learned are just that um, not we are vulnerable, 
but when we work together, um, uh, we can overcome these things. And so, you know, I am struck, I'm so fortunate to work where I work with so many people who, you know, just leaned in and got the job done. And so it, it demonstrates to me that no matter what the challenge, um, if we can work together, we can make it through this. And then as far as the vaccine, just get it. Don't overthink it, just get it. Sounds good, just do it. So I'd like to thank Dr. Kendall Cobb and Dr. Thomas Frazier for sharing their time and expertise with us. Your advice is right on target. I've learned a lot today. And to thank you all for our viewers for joining us for this program, knowledge is power. And this important information shared will help you and our community understand the importance of vaccination, decrease your apprehension to receiving the vaccine, and I hope will encourage you to get vaccinated. I'm thrilled that I've been vaccinated. And when people see others in their family and community getting vaccinated and doing well, it's a game changer. Nothing succeeds like success and nothing convinces people like storytelling. Please tell yours. Just a reminder, this event was pre-recorded. If you have any questions about the information shared today, please email celebrate sisterhood at ccf.org. A copy of this session along with all of our archived events will be available on our website, clevelandclinic.org forward slash celebrate sisterhood. Also, mark your calendars and inform your friends of our next virtual session that will be on Thursday, May 27th. Our guests will be Dr. Deatre Matina and Chef Yolanda Ramos. The topic will be culinary medicine. Are you digging your grave with your fork? Our guests will share sage advice, teach you how to navigate grocery store aisles to stay healthy and incorporate flavor over fat into your recipes. Visit clevelandclinic.org forward slash celebrate sisterhood to register. Remember, we are here to help you. If you need to make an appointment with a Cleveland Clinic provider, please call 866-320-4573 or visit clevelandclinic.org forward slash appointments. Don't procrastinate, vaccinate. Please stay healthy, stay safe, Stop the spread by washing your hands frequently, social distancing by six feet apart, and consistently wearing your mask properly.